Tom Aspinall was potentially one of my favorite fighters to analyze. Big guys that can move with that amount of speed aren't exactly a dime a dozen. So in today's video first, we're going to take some general math and attempt to explain why bigger guys who move fast are so dangerous. Then we're going to switch gears and explore some of the underlying anatomy and kinesiology behind some of Tom Aspinall's most impressive displays of athleticism. Also. Will he ever fight John Jones? In order to understand why fast heavyweights are so much more dangerous, we've got to look at the math a bit. This is going to be very general, but it's going to help clear up some of the commonly misused vocabulary that we use in the combat sports that even I mess up sometimes. Here are the three equations that we're going to be working with today. P equals power, W equals work, and F equals force. P equals work divided by the elapsed amount of time. W equals force times distance, and force equals mass times acceleration. Okay, so we've got two calculators here. I tried to find one that had an expression of force from M, so F equals MA. I tried to find one that had MA times D, uh, but we I wasn't able to find that. So essentially we have the same formula that we talked about before. We have P equals work, and work is expressed, but force times distance, over the change in the amount of time. Now, in order to find the expression of F and MA, we have to use another calculator. So F equals MA, Newton's second law, we are going to manipulate the mass and then the acceleration to get F and then we'll plug in F to the numerator of this. So the first situation we're going to do in order to show that bigger guys moving quickly are so dangerous is so we're going to take a smaller dude. So let's say this guy's arm, since we're, we're going to talk about a punch, okay, we'll say this guy's arm weighs five kilograms, right? so around 10 pounds, 11 pounds. And let's say it's accelerating at the acceleration of gravity, 9.8, we'll go 9.82 meters per second squared, just to 49.1 newtons, okay? So this is a guy whose arm weighs five, or well, doesn't weigh, it's five kilograms of mass, accelerating at 9.82 meters per second squared, and we get F equals 49.1. So the force, 49.1, and this is unit of measurement is newtons, but don't really worry about the unit of measurements. I just kind of want to do the general math and show you guys the numbers. The distance that they're moving, let's say from the winded back position to making contact is about, I don't know, one and a half meters, okay? A little over three feet. And then the time, we'll say he's doing it in half a second. So both of the first individual, same distance, or the distance is one and a half meters, 0.5 seconds for the time, that gives us 147.3 watts, okay? I want you to remember that number because all we're going to do, let's say that there's somebody who has an arm that is, let's say two kilogram, bigger guys, so bigger arm, let's say it's two kilograms heavier, well, excuse me, two kilograms more of mass. Moving at the same acceleration, we calculate F, F now equals 68.74, so we, Increase the number in the numerator, 68.74. The number here in the numerator is increased. The same amount of distance and the same amount of time. So two guys, one has a bigger body, therefore a bigger arm, accelerating at the same speed. Distance and the same amount of time is now 206.22 watts. Now watts is just the unit of measurement for power, but you see how much higher that number is just by adding two kilograms of mask into uh, the force for, in order to get F. Okay, now let's just say that we have two guys who have seven kilogram arms. They accelerate at 9.82 meters per second squared. They're going the same amount of distance, but now they're gonna do it really fast. So let's say it's 0.3 seconds, 343.7. So not only do big guys enjoy a privilege of being heavier or having heavier or more mass in their arm or whatever they're swinging, they also enjoy, if they're moving just as fast as young or as smaller guys, moving at that same time. So they're manipulating the numerator and the denominator to increase the total number of wattage or power that they can produce whenever they throw a strike. And that, in a nutshell, is why bigger guys who move as fast as smaller guys are super powerful. So now hopefully you have a bit more of an understanding behind why big guys who move fast are so dangerous. Now let's take a look at the actual movements. First we're going to look at the knockout combo of Tom Aspinall's debut against Jake Collier. Alright, so as promised, this is Tom Aspinall and Jake Collier, and 
quite honestly, I feel kind of bad for Jake Collard. God, I didn't even know what he's walking into. <laughs> Poor guy. He's just nowhere near as quickly as Tom. But we're going we're gonna to start from the knee, and then we're going to show how really fast that one-two is, uh, and, and really Jake Collard didn't, didn't stand a chance. So let's start by breaking down the, the knee. So he clenches really well, and he's got his hip relatively extended, kind of loading up for the knee. Uh, those hip flexors like the rectus femoris, the iliopsoas, TFL, things like that are starting to eccentrically elongate as he brings his hip forward here. Now he doesn't get a ton of hip extension, uh, but he is taking advantage of that stretch reflex, all, although be it pretty small. He's loading that front leg so that whenever, when we saw this, whenever we looked at the flying knee kick, he's loading that front leg so that he can kind of extend using his quads and his glutes of the leg that's planted to get a little bit more power through the hips. Now he's driving up through the clinch, which is great. So we talked about last time when we looked at the flying knee that sometimes people make contact at about 90 degrees of hip flexion. And as far as the length tension relationship is concerned of those muscles, particularly the, the really big hip flexor so as major, it really behooves you to make contact as close to about halfway through the full range of motion as you can. Uh, and then sometimes if people are hitting really low, uh, you don't really get the full effect. But he pulls down makes really good contact, and as soon as he plants, I mean, my man hasn't even stood up straight yet. He's already going for the jab. So he loads that front leg, and you can see that as soon as he lands that jab, using muscles like the tricep and the anterior delt, and really even the anterior, or serratus anterior for that shoulder protraction, or that shoulder blade protraction that we've seen so much in people who follow through really well. Even though he didn't follow through well here, that is a co-contraction with that the anterior delt and the tricep to help extend the arm and flex the shoulder. Makes really good contact and you can even see his hips starting to load up and switch around. So he moves nice. Now he doesn't get a ton of hip, the hip and shoulder dissociation that we talk about. We'll, we'll look at it at the next view. Uh, but this, he, he really didn't get a lot of the stretch shortened cycle here, uh, but he does get some of it. So you can see it muscles like the pec major and the anterior delt that are responsible for that movement like a horizontal adduction that we see in a hook or for the two really not a hook but still the same muscles are throwing that punch a little bit more tricep involvement as well so he as he's hitting the the one as his arm winds back for the two that's the eccentric phase of that stretch shorten cycle so eccentrically loaded pec anterior delt and then switches to the concentric quicker than Collier can blink and pops him with the one, two. All right, so really good stuff. We're gonna show it full speed, but let's talk through it one more time. So clinch, really good length, length tension relationship in the hip flexors whenever he's throwing that knee. And then as soon as he plants that back leg, he gets he turns his hips and throws the, the one, or throws the one. Really good use of timing there. And then before he can even think about it, he gets hit with the two and drops. So let's watch it all the way through full speed. And it's in slow-mo, so you can't really appreciate how fast it is in real time, but I'll link these in the description so you can watch them full speed. Just kidding, I forgot that I have another view for this one. <laughs> okay, and, and we'll do it really quick because I think it shows how, how quickly he shifts his hips after that knee. So as soon as he hits that knee, after he clenches, hits the knee, plants, and immediately starts to throw that. And you can tell there, the a little bit easier, the anterior delt and the tricep involvement here. Uh, you definitely get some pec major, but this is kind of, you know, a typical jab is supposed to be really quick catch him off guard, which it did. It was a perfectly landed jab, and then his hips are already starting to switch here. So he's got his foot planted, and he's loading his center of mass onto that front leg to help bring that center of mass forward. So when he throws the two, his hips are facing his opponent and he gets all of that nice trunk rotation. Now again, he's not dissociating his hips too much, uh, but he is moving in unison, which in this case is better since he's trying to time it a little bit better as well. So that one and the two, and you can see why Kurt, or excuse me, why Jake Collier goes down because of that really quick rapid rotation that we see in folks that axonal stretching happens the most with really quick accelerating rotational forces uh, and it just knocks him down and he didn't have a chance. Really good stuff. Next is his first fight returning back from the knee injury against Tybura. 
All right, so in this Tibera fight, there was one clip that I wanted to originally show you, but as I was watching through, I was like, this is just an, an amazing display of athleticism. Uh, this is a, a really good high kick. And just think about how big Tom Aspinall is. Look at, so we'll just start from here. When he bounces off of that front leg, we've, we've talked about the roundhouse kick before, bouncing off that back leg, getting the good stretch reflex from the calf and with the hip extension there to bring bring his leg all the way around like you know that baseball bat analogy they talk about in Muay Thai. Again, muscles like the rectus femoris that cross the hip and the knee, so they flex the hip and extend the knee, uh, are really on a lot of stretch there to help produce a, lot of, a little bit more force. And he's got that really good arm swing, that really good Thai arm swing to kind of help get all of that transverse rotational power along the transverse plane to make contact. He is leaning back, but he's got a nice uh, right flexion and right rotation along with trunk flexion. His head is not really flexed like you'll see in a traditional Muay Thai, but this is arguably better uh, since you're keeping your eye on the opponent and you're not really sacrificing any of your defense. Uh, and just to understand how much power he's got here, look how far he got back. I mean, there's nothing Ty Burrow really could have done here other than defend it the way that he did. I mean, he made contact on his shoulder, but the guy goes flying probably four or five feet, uh, and then he's able to, to really capitalize on the space there. Uh, but that's something that I wanted to show you guys first because the amount of, the amount of hip switch and the rotation that he gets here, I mean, talk about hip shoulder dissociation. I mean, he goes from hips maybe at a 45 degree. Now shoulders, shoulders are starting the whip here instead of the hips. Typically with a punch, we see the hips start and then it kind of flows through at the thoracic or the torso, lumbosacral, then thoracolumbar and then thoracic rotation into the extremity. But here we see the, we see the shoulders go first because that upper body arm swing is kind of whipping down through the body instead of up through the punch. And so he's got a good 45 degree angle here with the hips kind of facing towards the crypto sign while his shoulders are facing Tabura. And then as the arm continues to, to flow through and his shoulders stay relatively square, his shoulders or his hips whip all the way around to where they're facing almost all the way over here to the crowd. So really incredible stuff and hard to imagine getting hit by somebody like that and being okay afterwards. And finally, the knockdown against Curb's Blades, since that's who he was fighting originally when he was injured. But then he got a well-deserved second chance and took full advantage of it. This one's going to be quick, but I felt like I had to include it. All right, so like I said before, this one's going to be relatively short uh, because this is just a picture-perfect jab. Shows how quickly he's moving. Uh, and Curtis Blades really didn't see it coming or have time to react, honestly. He didn't even fully extend his arm all the way through, so he didn't have as much power as he could have had but it's a perfect jab and he, he didn't hit the overhand like he wanted to. But this is ultimately what led to Curtis Blades going down in his actual fight with him. So this is, this is the fight, his second fight that he got to you know, avenge his, his uh, MCL injury. So as he pushes off of his back leg and shifts his center of mass forward, so he's pushing off with his calves and his quads, his hips are completely perpendicular when it comes to the plane of his opponent here. So his hips are facing this way and his opponent is in front of him. Uh, this is how a lot of people set up really good jabs. As he moves that center of mass forward, he's not getting a ton of power from his torso because they're not, again, no hip and shoulder dissociation here. It's just almost purely in what we call the frontal plane. So he's moving almost laterally here as the front leg starts to accept the weight. So a lot of middle delt for shoulder abduction, a little bit of serratus anterior for scapular abduction, uh, but a lot of anterior, or excuse me, a lot of tricep for elbow extension when he does this. A lot of a tricep heavy movement here, and he just lands it perfectly. So pressing off the back leg, torso moving forward, accepting his weight on the left leg, moving in the frontal plane or the, or the coronal plane is another word for it. Middle delt or abducting the shoulder. We got the tricep and the serratus anterior, abducting the scapula and extending the elbow, all co-contracting to land perfectly right on the button with Curtis Blades. And he's fortunate that that overhand didn't hit. 
All right, I hope this really helps you understand how much of a problem Tom Aspinall actually is. As for whether he'll fight John Jones or not, my prediction is that John Jones knows that he doesn't really have many fights left if any. And if he fights Aspinall, the chances that he leaves the UFC on a high ground are slim to none. So if I were a betting man, I'd say it doesn't happen. But my opinion means fuck all, so let me know what you guys think. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you next time.